Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm going to pass it over to Soha Mahmood with um, HCD to get started. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Can somebody give me a thumbs up that they can hear me okay? Perfect. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us and tuning in. Melissa, do we want to go ahead and get started or should we allow another minute to let people in or are we, should we pretty much get going? I think we can get started. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in to this presentation. We're really excited you can all join us, especially from your busy schedules. Um, you know, to give you a little context <clears throat> as to why we're doing this uh, webinar today is We've heard overwhelmingly from local governments and their consultants about some of the challenges that you guys have been facing when conducting outreach as part of updating your housing elements during a pandemic while also meeting housing element deadlines. So today we hope we can provide you with strategies and tools that, can take, that you can directly take away and apply to your housing elements when conducting public engagement as part of your housing element update. Next slide, Melissa. Great. So again, our objectives today really is to help you understand um, the thank you the community engagement public participation requirements as part of your updating your housing elements. Not only what statute says, but kind of what ATD expects to see in your housing element. And secondly, our uh, we hope that we can teach you some strategies and techniques and best practices to conduct community engagement in this virtual environment. Next slide, please. Great, thanks. Today's agenda consists of introduction of our panelists, an overview of what we'll be discussing. Then I will talk shortly about why public engagement is important for the housing element and housing policies in general. Next, I'll go into the statutory requirement for public participation and HCD's guidance on meeting those requirements. Then I'll hand it over to our panelists from ILG, also known as Institute for Local Government, and PlaceWorks to provide best practices and tips on virtual engagement. As part of this presentation, again, we also really want to provide you with real world examples from jurisdictions who are currently updating their housing elements and implementing virtual engagement strategies and some of the problem solving that they've done throughout this process. Lastly, for closing, we'll have a short Q&A session and we'll wrap up this webinar with some additional resources we hope to provide you again while you're conducting virtual engagement during this time. Next slide, please. Melissa, I'll hand it off. Oh, sorry. Looks like we got the presenter slide, thank you. Um, so before we go ahead and talk about logistics, again, like I said, our goal here today is to provide you guidance and clarity on what the statute requires when conducting public engagement as part of your updating your housing element while also taking COVID-19 into consideration. In addition to HCD's guidance, we have a esteemed panel here today, which will also provide strategies and best practices on how to conduct virtual engagement. Our panel includes Melissa from the Institute for Local Government, ILG specializes in helping local governments impl implement inclusive engagement strategies. ILG is also part of the HCD <clears throat> technical assistance team for accelerating housing production. We also have Wendy from PlaceWorks who specializes on outreach for housing planning. PlaceWorks is also the lead contractor as part of the HCD TA team on accelerating housing production. Lastly, we are joined by three jurisdictions, Placer County, Elk Grove, and Chula Vista, who have been in the process of updating their housing elements and conducting public engagement during COVID. Today, again, we hope that throughout this presentation, you can take away practical strategies as you're updating your housing element. Next slide, please. Melissa, I'll hand it over to you, hand it off to you to handle some logistics. Perfect, thanks, Sohab. Um, just a few notes before we jump into the meat of the presentation um, from a logistical perspective. Um, first, we are recording this presentation. Um, I've already seen a couple of questions come into that effect. Um, so we will be recording it and then posting it and distributing it to all uh, registrants, um, likely later this week, but definitely by next week at the latest. Um, all of your lines have been muted for the duration of the webinar due to the size of the audience we have today. Um, but you can definitely ask a question at any point during the webinar through the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your, of your screen in your control panel. Um, as Soha mentioned, we do have time for Q&A held at the end of the presentation. Um, but you're welcome to submit those questions at any point in time. Um, so before we get started, we are hoping that you'll humor us and do some, some polling. We're going to practice what we preach here in terms of uh, engagement in a uh, virtual environment. So if you can go ahead and open either um, your smartphone or another browser window on your computer or tablet, and then go to sift.ly. We're going to just do a few um, instant polling questions to 
get a sense of who's joining us today as well as some of the, the challenges you're facing in um, this en engaging in this virtual world. So again, that's sift.ly, and you'll see the participant code there on the screen. And now hopefully you all see my browser window. Yep. Okay, perfect. Fine. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll. Um, don't worry if you're still connecting. The code and the um, browser will stay up there. We just have a kind of a softball question to get us started um, and get everybody used to the software. So um, how many cups of coffee have you had today? I am always amazed by the amount of people that don't drink coffee. Got a third of our participants today that haven't had any. Hats off to them. Right? I can't function with that. <laughs> um, and if you're still joining again, you should be able to see in the top right hand uh, corner of the screen the uh, URL and the, the code there. Perfect. So it looks like most people answered this question. So I'm going to move into uh, some of our other questions. So what best describes your agency or organization? Are you with a city or a county, um, perhaps a, a consulting firm, so you're a private company, nonprofit? So it looks like predominantly we've got cities on the line. Um, followed by counties and private um, or corporate entities. Looks like a couple special districts, couple nonprofit representatives, about 5% from the state. Perfect, thank you. So in a similar vein, um, what best describes your relationship to local government? Are you a staff member, elected official? Are you a consultant? So again, overwhelmingly, it looks like we've got staff on the line, about a little more than 75% of you all. Great. Some consultants, no elected officials. Great. And uh, so these next few questions are um, related explicitly to your housing element. So we're wondering um, where you are in the process. We've got about half of you are just getting started. Another 40% haven't started yet. So you guys are at the beginning stage for the most part, it looks like. Some people are halfway done. Great. Um, in terms of the community engagement aspect, when do you plan to engage your community as part of this process? So throughout, we'd love to see that, over 80%, that's great. Good answers. <laughs> exactly, it's a great answer. Not to skew the results, though, we want honest, honest answers here. <laughs> For those of you that have said other, if you wouldn't mind kind of dropping into the the questions box um, when when you're planning to do that. Just curious from a, our perspective. Perfect. Um, so now we, the next few questions we're going to go through are, are directly related to this community engagement 
um, process and, and how you all are doing there. Um, so in general, we're curious, how much participation are you seeing in the virtual environment? And this is definitely something we'll speak to later in the presentation in terms of um, some of the benefits and positive sides of, of the virtual engagement versus some of the, the challenges that come up around um, the digital divide and access and things like that. Um, this is a fairly even split. A lot of majority of you are saying more than before. Um, so the yeah, this is pretty typical. We, we've got jurisdictions usually on both sides at this point in terms of that they're seeing more and seeing less. So um, thank you. Um, and so this is kind of in general, not necessarily just related to the virtual environment, but what are some of the challenges you all face um, when engaging your community? And this one is you, you can pick your top three, but then make sure you submit so that we can see the um, answers on the screen. And you'll see these move around as people respond. And again, we'll, um, we'll dig into some of these pieces as we go through the presentation around reaching beyond um, the usuals or the same 10 people that usually participate. Um, I think that housing in particular, you end up with residents that are uninformed on the, on the issues, um, insufficient staffing and time, and then followed by politically extreme participants and need more effective public engagement tools. We definitely will hit on the tool um, piece a little bit later today as well. Um, and then just to give us a sense, what are the tools that you all are using right now? I um, mean, you could submit more than one of these. This doesn't have to be just a, a one and done uh, question, but are you using surveys? Are you usually using Zoom or other um, platforms to do virtual meetings? Um, are you really doubling down on some of your social media efforts or um, you know, using online um, forums or things like that? Some yeah, explicit tools here around flash votes, listserv, your website, yes. Town halls, yeah, teletown halls. Um, use of graphics, that's a, a good one. E blast. M Melissa, there's a question, what does PE mean? Oh, I'm sorry, it, the, the, we have limited characters. Uh, PE is a shorthand for public engagement. Powtoons for videos, yep. More videos, YouTube, things like that. I'm going to see if this will work, and I can turn this into a word cloud so you guys can see the most um, common words that are coming through here, if my internet will support it. I'm not seeing, are you guys seeing that populate in a word cloud? Oh, there we go. So Zoom, obviously, is a big one. Surveys, um, email, social media, you see there. Facebook is pretty big, listservs, um, so a lot of uh, consistency here in terms of what you all are using, next door, newspapers. I like that self-guided walking tour, that sounds interesting. Yeah, that's a, a new way to do kind of site visits, I would assume, right? Great, um, so we've got two more questions for you all before we jump into the presentation. Um, what are you finding challenging about engaging in the virtual world? It's new, yeah, tech issues, Zoom or virtual meeting fatigue, yes. 
language barriers and translation services. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, tech issues is a big one. Yeah, older populations and how do you find ways to engage them if they're not comfortable in a super digital world? Digital divide issues around Wi-Fi connectivity, yes. Yeah. And a lot of this really has to do, obviously, with the demographics of your community and who you're trying to reach and um, their comfort and ability to access some of these tools as well, which we will also talk about. Hard to reach disadvantaged communities, definitely. Yeah, related to the income disparity. Political opinions on posts, yes. Reformat this for you guys real quick. Um, language barriers again, I see. Staff capacity. Yeah, the preference for face to face. Melissa, there's a question if we can share the results of all of these. Is this or is this just in real time? No, um, I, there is a link um, that will generate all the results, and I'm happy to share that in the follow-up um, email that we send out um, with the recording and everything like that. So um, we'll definitely do that. Great. And there's a question um, about this actual tool um, and using it that they think it's pretty cool. So Yeah, so this platform that we're using right now is called Meeting Sift. Um, and it allows for this obviously real time um, feedback and engagement, um, even in a virtual world. We use this in in um, in person meetings as well, but it it translates well um, into the um, go to meeting or Zoom meeting world as well. Um, but there's other platforms out there too that we'll talk about um, that I'll share some information about in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, this one's called Meeting Set, um, and it's pretty affordable, which is a nice um, plug from a nonprofit too. Um, but you see here a lot of, again, uh, consistency around tech issues, language barriers, digital divide, um, older populations. Um, so a lot of the same challenges that you all are, are seeing. Um, and we have one final question for you all. Um, what's going well? What, um, what are you liking about this? What might you keep doing even when we can meet again in person? Yeah, so it is. It does allow people who don't normally participate to potentially participate. Less travel involved, obviously. Force you to try new things. I like that. Yeah, we have been talking about digital engagement for a long time, and I think that um, the pandemic has finally forced people to start to try things outside their comfort zone. Convenience, flexibility, less travel. Yeah, digital literacy is increasing. And Melissa, it's called SIFT, SIFT, S-I-F-T. There was some questions about pronunciation of this. Sorry, it's called meeting, meeting SIFT is what the, the software is called. And I can drop that into the, the chat here for you all. Less grandstanding. Yeah, you can you can mute people. It's easier than taking the microphone away from them, right? <laughs> um, perfect. Um, yeah. So again, I'll send out the results with the follow-up email. But um, appreciate you all um, participating, and we get to demonstrate one of the tools that you all can use in this environment as well. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this up and close it out um, and then turn everything back over to no daycare. That's a, <laughs> no need for shiny shoes. I like that one too. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and finish this and I'll get back to our um, get back to our PowerPoint here. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for warming up the crowd and um, all the responses that we got. Hopefully today we can kind of help address some of those responses again really quickly just to go over, you know, why are we here? Why hopefully did all of you join as we understand there are housing element deadlines looming. Uh, we understand that there's a pandemic going on right now and that can make um, community participation difficult, especially 
amongst vulnerable communities. And we also understand there are statutory requirements to doing engagement, especially around your housing element. So hopefully we can address a lot of that today and give you some follow-up material to continue to have that material with you while you're, you're um, updating your housing element. Next slide, please. Okay, great, thank you, Melissa. So again, why is public engagement important in outreach? Well, other than the statutory requirements that we know about for the housing element, there are a lot of other important reasons why we should be doing public engagement. Your housing element sets the framework for housing to occur in your community. So first, it builds support. The preparation of your housing element is an opportunity to build support, relationships, and trust with your community on housing topics. Establishing these relationships early on can potentially increase the likelihood that community members will be supportive for proposed housing projects that come through the pipeline throughout the planning period, which is ultimately what the goal is here. Second, it can help establish some shared values. Engaging your community through this opportunity, through the housing element update, can help you understand what does your community want and develop those shared values based on their interests. Also, this can be a valuable checkpoint when you're trying to understand what your community wants and values, and if there might seem to be a lack of interest or support for housing, there is an opportunity here to create educational campaigns on why housing is important and the different types of housing. So this is you know, kind of a little bit of a checkpoint to see where is my community at when it comes to housing development in my community, and can I do anything better to kind of you know, maybe debunk some myths and get my community to be a little bit more supportive on housing. Um, also, this opportunity, this housing element update process gives an opportunity to hear from different economic segments of your community. It can give a voice to your community to honestly speak about what are the best housing strategies that should be implemented throughout this planning period. And lastly, as we all know, there are some statutory requirements for public participation when it comes to updating your housing element. So in addition to government code section 65583C7, which I will go over, AB 686, which is the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, also requires that local governments include an analysis of fair housing for housing elements that are due on or after January 1st, 2021. So AB 686 also states that that analysis should be in, accord in accordance with the 2015 rule. Part of that 2015 rule said that you must have meaningful community participation. So meaningful community participation could mean, for example, did you reach out to your protected classes? Um, so if you want to satisfy that public participation requirement also as part of AB 686, it's just even that much more important to make sure you're really engaging in every part of your community, your economic segments and your protected classes as well. Next slide, please. So also just a note that I wanted to make because we may go through this webinar a little quickly is that before I even get into the requirements and practices, HCD right now is developing a detailed guide on con conducting public engagement for the housing element. It's gonna go into detail um, as to a lot of what we're talking about today and kind of summarize some best practices. It's gonna include the law, what's required, and even a step-by-step -step checklist on how to meet the requirements w along with case studies. Um, so just you know, to give you a heads up, we may go through this quickly, but we are gonna have a detailed guide available that will summarize a lot of what we're talking about today. Next slide, please. So housing element statute, as stated, maybe some of us are very familiar with it. Government code section 65583C7 says that local governments shall make a diligent effort to achieve public participation of all economic segments of the community in the development of the housing element and the program shall describe this effort. So what does that mean? What does it mean to make a diligent effort? What does it mean to reach out to all economic segments of a community? So before getting into, you know, how do you satisfy those requirements, public engagement and outreach efforts are going to look different in every community. There is no one size fits all. It's gonna be based on the size of your jurisdiction, who is in your community, the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic makeup of your jurisdiction, along with the vulnerable populations and special needs populations you might have in your community. It's also really important that you include and make a diligent effort to engage your lower income households and or any organizations that represent their interests. Next slide, please. Okay, so first one, 
So again, how does it look? What could diligent outreach look like? So it's important first to do outreach in a variety of formats using a variety of channels. Because while social media may work potentially, you know, to reach your potentially younger populations, not everyone is on social media. And while newsletters may work for the population that reads them, not everyone is reading local newsletters. So if you only stick and limit yourself to one to two outreach channels, you are potentially limiting how and how many people can get this valuable information and ultimately creating limited opportunities for public participation to very select groups of people. So using several different outreach channels increases the amount of people that you could potentially reach. Also keep in mind, choose outreach channels based on your population. It's really, really important to look at your data. Who is in your community? Your housing needs section as part of the housing element is one place it tells you that, but also in other activities that you're doing at the local government level, think about what's the general makeup? Who is coming out to meetings? Who do you reach out to? And think about, again, who is in your community? What is it made of? And again, for most, for example, if you know most people don't read or subscribe, let's say to the local newspaper, for example, it may not be the best outreach channel to use. Or if you know that most people don't stop by the city website to get updates, it may also not be the best outreach channel. Or vice versa, if a lot, you know, a huge population of people that cover a lot of economic segments do come to the city website to get updates on local topics, that might be a great channel. So really important to diversify your outreach channels and your formats you're using. Again, that kind of says you're diligently making those outreach attempts to all of your communities. Second, is looking at who is engaged in your community with the different economic segments. So this is really going into reaching out to the people who might represent the different types of communities within your jurisdiction. So again, while of course, hopefully, hopefully you've done a lot of outreach through, let's say, your website, let's say through social media, let's say through surveys, um, and you know, using all the other outreach channels that I have mentioned, if you're still not getting the feedback or hearing back from specific groups, think about who represents those communities, who knows them, who serves them. Local stakeholder groups can be a great way to get feedback and engagement on your housing element, both just because it, they should be incorporated as part of that update, but also because they can act as a representation of specific economic segments. So for example, let's say you're trying to reach out to people who are experiencing homelessness in your community and you're not getting feedback. Think about the nonprofits, local faith-based faith, local faith-based organizations and service providers who serve that population within your jurisdiction or maybe even within your region. They hopefully can represent some of their interests of people experiencing homelessness and especially if they're working with them day in and day out and provide you valuable feedback to maybe what types of programs and policies should be implemented with the housing element update. Next slide, please. So that was the first part. You know, again, how can you do diligent, I mean, how to make sure you're doing diligent outreach. The second part is the housing element should clearly describe your efforts to engage the community throughout the housing element process. So what type of outreach did you do what type of outreach channels did you use? And clearly describe that through the housing element process. So next slide, please. So how, how should we, how could you meet this requirement potentially? So I put hopefully a handy dandy table here. Um, and again, my goal here is to give you practical things you can take directly back to your housing element. So feel free to copy and paste this table in your housing element if it suits you. But again, you want to describe what your approach was. What was your public outreach approach and how did you come up with it? So for example, let's say you used a combination of, again, let's just go back to social media and newspapers to release a survey on getting feedback for the housing element. Talk about why you consider those outreach channels. For example, you could say majority of your community does get their local news from, the social, from social media and the newspaper. And you've seen a lot of success in the past using those channels and also, we had stakeholder meetings with four local organization, organizations that collectively represent 40% of the community. So really describing why and how you came up with this strategy tells HCD that you've thought about who's in your community and you've really thoughtfully thought, thoughtfully put in the work to see what are the best ways to reach who's in your community. So again, step one is reaffirming that you've looked at who's in your community and what the best ways of reaching that population was. Second, 
now that you have now that you've described your approach and why you use those outreach channels, describe what your outreach efforts actually look like. How many meetings, how many channels, how many methods, and what was your target audience? So you can see in this table, and you know, I hope that this, you know, feel free to customize it if you do want to use it as part of your housing update update, but you can see in this table. One outreach method for this city was a survey via newspaper ads and local ethnic newspapers. And their target audience was to, to capture the different language groups that are within their community. And participation, you know, they received X amount of survey results, for example. Um, again, second one was online public meetings and hearings. That was to kind of target subject matter experts and local elected officials. Um, and so, so forth. Again, that's a table that you can use to really summarize each outreach method and the target audience. Next slide, please. And if you give me one second, let me turn off these notifications that are coming up. Okay. So now, here's the third part. Again, my goal here is to tell you each part of the analysis that's required as part of your housing element update, and then also tell you how you could satisfy that analysis. So the third part states, the housing element should, do, should clearly describe who was invited to participate, which groups actually participated, general comments received, and how comments were incorporated into the housing element. So the first part that we just went over was describing who was invited, who participated, and you can actually include who was invited and who participated in the table that I just presented on. Um, and then for the second part, this really is talking about referring to what comments you received and how you incorporated that into your element. So next slide, please. So again, here's another table. Um, so a lot of people are sometimes concerned as part of their housing element. Oh my God, I have to address I have to address every single comment I received, or I need to make sure that every single comment I received is somehow in the housing element. Not necessarily. One strategy is by reviewing all the comments you received and filtering out for some of the most common responses. So for example, let's say you received you know of 20% of your comments. Um, mo of the 20% of your comments, the community said voicing their need for multifamily housing is really important, and you received that comment through various groups of people and various economic segments. In that table, you would want to include that comment, who you received it from, and maybe even how many times you received it, or again, a percentage, and the outreach channel maybe that you received it from. Again, this is showing that you came up with a strategy, you implemented it, Maybe that outreach channel really did work, and you, as a result of that, you got this comment that you received from a, you know, a huge port part of your population, and then you're also incorporating it in your housing element. So here it shows, you know, we need more more multifamily housing, which is the common 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 um, statement that's heard. And in the the table that says how is the comment addressed, you can put that I address this I address this in my program section. I added program you know, A, B, and C to add more multifamily housing. We have a program to, uh, to amend our zoning to, seek, um, to include more multifamily housing in more of our zoning districts. And we're also gonna be looking at regulatory constraints to multifamily housing. So you know, if you can incorporate in parts of your housing element, that's great, but also know you can incorporate some of what, the, what your community is saying into your program section. You know, if the community says zoning is making it really difficult to develop anything other than a single family home. Well, you can address it in programs, you know, again, put in a couple programs or or if you already have programs to address other types of housing or to make sure that not just single family housing is being developed, but all types of housing are being developed in your community. Next slide, please. Great. And last requisite analysis is the housing element should de clearly describe any ongoing efforts to engage the public and stakeholders in the implementation of the housing element. Next slide, please. So I made a table of what could ongoing engagement look like. Again, this is what it could look like. It can look very different for every jurisdiction, as it might, as it should, because each jurisdiction is unique in what works for them and what doesn't. Here's, again, just some ways that um, you could do ongoing engagement. And this is based on housing elements that I've reviewed and things we've just heard from local governments. Your annual progress reports that you submit to HCD every month that tracks the implementation of your programs, that's a great way to get feedback from your community to see well, how is our programs doing? Are you know are they doing good, or is this an is this a time and this an area where we can start improving some of these programs and reach out to the community using your annual progress reports, sometimes known as your APRs, to to 
gain input on, you know, hey, we're updating. We want to see how the implementation of our programs are doing. Is this working? Or maybe we can modify this program to make it work better. Another one we've seen is, a hou is housing as a standing agenda item at city council meetings. This is really um, an example we saw as just a way to provide community members to openly speak about housing in general in their community. Again, another venue or avenue to give people a place that they can openly speak about some of their concerns and, and things that they're facing. Um, another ongoing engagement, maybe it's a regional and local planning director meeting um, where the, you discuss and you coordinate best practices with other local governments, where you also discuss you know, how, how your housing element update how the implementation of your housing element's been going and what's been working for that. Lastly is maybe a citizen advisory group. We've seen this in the Sandag area where they maintain a citizen advisory group and they meet on a quarterly basis and each citizen um, represents a specific neighborhood within that community. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and to sum it up, you know, it's a catch-all slide and just really things to remember as part of doing public outreach. Be intentional when crafting your outreach strategy, meaning, again, consider who is in your, who is in your community and consider what are the best ways or best methods to reach those groups and look for feedback from stakeholders that regularly interact with those groups that you're trying to reach. Second, it's important to make sure your housing element draft is available before it goes to HCD for review. So the public can actually review and provide feedback on the written document that you're getting engagement, that you're, you're acquiring, that you're getting engagement for. Also, similar to what I said in my first point, stakeholder outreach can be a great way to help you understand how to reach communities like low-income communities, vulnerable populations, or special needs groups that you may, have be, you may have be having a hard time reaching right now. Also, there may be stakeholders that are representative of a specific population and can speak to their needs. So using stakeholder interviews in lieu sometimes when you can't reach a specific population after you've tried at least a couple times to reach that population. Also, something to just keep in mind and again emphasize is knowing your community. If you know there is more than one commonly spoken language, for example, in your community, make sure your strategies meet the needs of that part of your community. Also, if you know that you have a population with um, people with disabilities, make sure that you have documents that might be ADA compliant or you're offering your documents, your marketing materials, and just other avenues to make sure your ADA community and people who do speak another language or uh, other type of populations can also engage in the housing element process. Next slide. And Melissa, I'll hand it off to you now. Sorry, not Melissa, Wendy from PlaceWorks. I'll hand it off to you to talk about um, more public participation strategies. Thanks, so Hob. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Um, my slides are going to focus kind of stepping back a little, looking at the fundamentals of public participation. Um, I am a outreach practitioner at PlaceWorks, but I'm also a national ambassador for the International Association of Public Participation. So a lot of the information that I'll be sharing with you is kind of looking at the nature of public participation, what we are seeing now. We've got a shift because of COVID, and we'll be looking at some of these ideas high level, and then Melissa will start to drill down into some of the tools that we're using, and then we also have guest speakers that are showing examples of what they're doing in their jurisdictions. And so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, but want to reserve time in the question and answer because I'm sure there are some of you that have specific questions about how you're dealing with the challenges of COVID and, and getting uh, out to people. And I, I think it was really helpful to see all your responses in the survey uh, at the very beginning because there are lots of tools and some of the things that we're hearing about the Zoom fatigue and loss of connection are very, very real, and we're looking at ways and have already been starting to brainstorm ways to, um, to get around that and to be better at what we're doing and connect digitally and in other ways. So this first slide you know, is probably a no-brainer to most of you. It's like, is all of this public participation? We look at all sorts of things from town halls to informational materials to websites to direct mailers. All of it is some form of public participation. Next slide, please. 
So the way that we look at it, and Sohab had been talking about this, is the public participation effort that you're putting together is a process that uses the public input to solve a problem or make decisions. And that seems pretty straightforward. We would think that that's common sense. But oftentimes we will have opportunities or we'll have challenges in that we are given a, an issue that we need to solve and the community doesn't agree with the problem that we're trying to solve or we know that there's only certain things that they can influence in decision making and so we have to have conversations with them about what the expectations are of what things they can weigh in on and so the challenge is, is that in the past historically it's been that little checkbox of all right public participation is something we have to do to make sure we, we said we talked to the public um, but the reality is that the the nature of public participation has become so much more important in that if you don't conduct the appropriate outreach at the very outset, by the time you get to the, the dais and you're going to council to get something approved, it's going to be much more of a challenge for you there. So putting the time in up front can save you time down the line. Um, and so the quote says, if you don't intend to use their input, don't ask them. So we will talk a little bit about that and how to organize the outreach as well. Next slide, please. We saw in your survey results that you know, some of you are engaging people throughout the process. Some people are going to do it at the end. So there's some variations on how to approach outreach. One of the things to consider about engaging the public early is that it really helps set a dialogue, a back and forth. Because if you think about it, right now, the way that the public process is set up, where you have a council sitting at a dais, you have a podium, you have people that have three minutes to talk. It's very intimidating and it's not a place where you can sit down, roll up your sleeves and collaborate. It's, you know, you're, if you're up there at the three minutes, you kind of feel like the sandwich has been served and you are fighting for your life to try to convey whatever that information is to hopefully shape the discussion. Um, so, you know, could you imagine if you were at home and you were trying to discuss um, some issue with your partner and they were standing above you and they said you had three minutes go and then you're that's it and then you don't get to talk anymore that doesn't really work and so that's the challenge we have in public participation in agencies it's the same way it's historically been that way and I see a lot of communities that have been shifting gears and really trying to put the engagement throughout the process build community intelligence build relationships so that they can build on that social capital throughout either their housing element process or other projects as they go along. Um, next slide, please. Historically, you know, our, our approach as planners has been, hey, guess what? There's an issue. We get really excited. We do the research. We come up with ideas. We collaborate with other colleagues and experts. And we put together a plan to say, hey, this is, this is a solution. We, we saw an issue and we came up with a solution and oh, we should probably communicate this with the community and share the ideas with them. So you take the big plan and the solution to the community. And the community is not thrilled. We call this in IEP2 the, the dad approach, decide, announce, and defend. So what ends up happening is we decide and we're trying to do the right thing. We're, we recognize that there are things that we could effectuate change within. Um, but in announcing it, you're stuck defending the end result instead of bringing the community along and having them shape the process. Next slide, please. So ideally, as many of you guys had talked about in your original survey response, is that if you can find ways to engage the public throughout the process and bring them along, it does end in a much more um, collaborative result. And it also, um, you know, makes the community feel like they had an opportunity to shape the, the final outcome. Now, does that mean you have to do a community meeting at every step? No, there are appropriate ways to engage the community either to show them, you know, if you've had a community meeting, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we did with your information. You post it on the website or you have interactive Q&A with the community and post that so that they always know where to go um, for the information and they know that it's consistently being updated. It's not just one static website and then nothing happens. They see that there's a constant communication back and forth. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna talk about? So, you know, at the end, what ends up happening is 
we've got this process and from outreach practitioners perspective, if we can get a community that's sometimes divided because there are very um, opposing ideas sometimes on how to reach the same you know, solution or to get to the same end, if somebody can go through the whole process and say, look, I don't necessarily agree with all of the things that are being recommended, but I do agree I had an opportunity to provide input my input was listened to and at least heard, uh, and these are the four things that I would change. Then you're you're uh, eliminating the us against them, and you're saying, okay, let's just work on the issues or the things that I don't agree with versus attacking the process, and then also having um, you know concern that there's like trust in government. So that way, the community feels like the the agency has provided that forum for them to share their ideas. Next slide, please. So one of the things to also consider is that public participation um, isn't marketing, it's not promoting, it's not lobbying or advocating for a specific outcome. Um, we want the outreach to make sure it's put in place so that you can have a sustainable decision, that people understand the trade-offs, like what the problem was, what the trade-offs are for the different options, and why the solution was selected and why that's the best of all the options available. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things too that we kind of have a debate in the uh, outreach community about is that you do need some form of marketing to create awareness about your project. But the difference is that public participation advocates for a good process versus the outcome. So now that doesn't mean that you can't, as staff, have recommendations or say, here's the trade off, this is what our recommendation is, and we think this is the best solution, and that's why we're recommending it. But what it does mean is that you're not taking one approach and saying that's the only way that this can be done. Because a lot of times what we'll find is that through the outreach process, we'll have some outcomes or ideas that come about collectively that wouldn't have come about if it was just done um, through the agency that was preparing the plan. Next slide, please. And I think this is probably fairly obvious to most, but you know there are a lot of benefits of public participation, and we really want those improved decisions. We want the trust in the outcome. You know, there's been a lot of distrust of government, so making sure you set up that outreach process so that it's a clear path about what decisions can I weigh in on. You know, where can I effectuate change? Because we know there are certain requirements that have to be met. So some things are able to be. Um, you know, influence and other things have to be just like, here's where it is. And making sure the community knows where they can uh, weigh in is really important so that not everything is on the table. Um, by doing that, we talked a little bit in the beginning, it helps to um, minimize delays in the project. So if you're moving along and all of a sudden you have a disruption and somebody says, we don't feel like we've been heard, going back to what Sohab said about identifying those communities and what's a successful outreach process to you, Meaning, you know, is it the most number of surveys received? Is it making sure we get to the communities that have been underrepresented? You know, identifying those goals up front is also very helpful because at the end, you really want to create and build those relationships long term so that you have the trust of the community so that when new projects come up, then you can build upon those. Next slide. So now I believe Melissa will be talking about some of the digital engagement challenges and tools that we have been using in outreach. Yes, thanks, Wendy. Um, I'm going to dig into some of the, um, the tools and the strategies to do this in a digital environment. Um, but just quickly before I get started, a reminder that you guys can all um, type questions into the Q&A box at any point in time, and we'll get to those in um, just a bit. Um, but if you have questions that come up along the way, please feel free to type those in. Um, so to start with, what are some of the challenges to doing this in a digital environment? I mean, I think all of these came up on the polling earlier um, in the webinar in terms of the digital divide and access and translation services and things like that. So um, these are some of the things we've been hearing from local governments across the state um, in terms of the challenges of doing this um, engagement in a, in a virtual world. Um, so to speak to kind of the access to technology and access to the internet, so that digital divide question um, is one that comes up a lot. And the way we're seeing some local governments address this is potentially working with community-based organizations. This has come up a couple of times in other presentations um, this, this afternoon. Um, but we've seen uh, CBOs either be able to provide hotspots 
for um, residents to use to engage, um, sometimes um, even the devices necessary to use to engage um, so they have more access to those high-tech platforms um, that you all may be exploring. The learning curve piece is, is also a big one, um, particularly as you look at the demographics of your community. Um, if you have an older skewing population, they may not be as comfortable um, on these higher tech platforms. So a couple of things to note there are one, um, like we did at the front end of this webinar, uh, make sure you're explaining the technology and how to engage. So what are the protocols and the etiquette? Are you going to be muted? How do you ask a question? How do you engage? Will um, there, there will be a recording available? All of those types of things to really help your um, residents engage in the platform in the way that you're hoping for them to engage. Um, on the language access and the um, uh, online engagement interactive piece, I'm going to dig into those um, more in just a minute. But kind of the key takeaway um, here is, and, they, and you'll hear me say this a lot, but it's the intentionality of your engagement. Um, so make sure you're thinking through um, who you're trying to reach and addressing these, um, these challenges as needed for your community. Uh, so this is, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just kind of an overview of some of the different digital tools that are available to you all to use um, for this work. Um, and uh, as I don't think so have noted, but um, your uh, SB2 and LEAP dollars can be used to pay for these platforms to use as an engagement um, piece if, if that's needed in your um, in your strategies and plans. Yes. Uh, but this is not an endorsement of Oh, sorry, Melissa. Yeah, I thank you for reminding me. This is Sohab. Um, you know, just a really quick note, your SB2 and LEAP grants um, for the 400 plus cities who applied for those funds. Um, if you had identified public engagement or public outreach as part of your tasks in your project timeline and budget for your SB2 and LEAP activities, you can use some of those funds to acquire the tools that you need to do this public engagement. So that's just an FYI. Sorry, Melissa, keep going. No, thank you. Um, so most of these, yeah, have a sliding scale of how much they cost based on your population or your budget, and so it's a different price point for each jurisdiction. But um, again, this is just kind of some of the, the tools that are available, um, whether it's polling software, some of these, um, such as Bang the Table, are a more um, broad-based platform that has online forums and maps and all things like that. I mean, you're going to hear a little bit more about a couple of these that the jurisdictions are using in the examples when we get to those in just a minute. Um, but again, it's thinking through what is the purpose of your engagement and are the tools that you're using going to gather that information? So are you looking for just information out in terms of the education of your community? Are you looking for a qualitative input? So do you need a survey tool? Um, do you need your community to be able to do trade-off analysis or prioritization? Um, are you looking for you know, in-person meetings via a, a virtual platform? So thinking through the components that you need to get the input that you want and then making sure that the tools you're using will garner that input for you. And so here's just some tips in terms of virtual meeting design. So we know almost all of you are probably doing Zoom meetings or go to webinar meetings or uh, Microsoft Teams or some of the other platforms. And so here's just some tips in terms of how to design your meetings to make them a little bit more interactive. Um, and a lot of these are things that we would recommend in in-person meetings as well. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of these. You can obviously read them on the screen. Um, but keeping your quote lectures short so that you're not talking at your virtual um, re your virtual uh, meeting attendees for too long. Considering learning styles, have visuals. Um, again, multiple voices. Allow for your residents to ask questions or tell their stories or give other examples. Um, explain your platform up front. Um, so just some things that you should be thinking about when you design your meeting. Um, in this virtual world. And here are some things that you can use to make them a little bit more interactive. Obviously, you saw the, the surveys and polls. We um, ex uh, used that as an example early in this webinar. Um, you saw word clouds as an example. Um, we used a softball quote um, opening question when we did the, um, the meeting sift about the, uh, how many cups of coffee you've had. Um, some of the platforms allow for um, you to do things like breakout groups and then reporting out and you can do um, charting in some of those platforms as well. You can have a whiteboard function where you can see people taking notes. Um, in smaller meetings, you can also have people kind of popcorn around and share ideas or have report outs from those small group discussions. Um, so just some things to think about again to make sure that um, your meetings are a little bit more interactive um, as much as possible in this virtual environment. 
Um, so again, this is just um, an overview of some of the platforms that are available for public meetings. Um, the Zoom and Microsoft Teams and GoToWebinar and Meeting are the ones we're seeing most often, but there's obviously other options there, as you can see on the bottom of the slide. Um, again, the takeaway here is to make sure that your platform allows for the type of a meeting you need to have. So for example, Zoom allows for um, interpretation, real-time interpretation. Um, so if that's something you need, that would be something you want to take into consideration as you're choosing your platform. It doesn't need to be able to stream live. Um, so things like Facebook Live or YouTube Live might be a consideration that you need to make. Um, do you need to be able to have breakout groups? Um, do you need people to be able to um, be muted so that you can uh, keep control of the meeting? All things to take into consideration as you're choosing your platform. So just a couple of quick points about language access. Um, and again, this is going to be uh, varied by the jurisdiction and, and your residents and your community. But overall in California, nearly 44% of residents speak a language other than English at home. And 6.8 million of those have a limited English proficiency. So this, in some areas of the state, this is a really big consideration that you need to be thinking about as you um, have public meetings and do public outreach. So here's just some high level tips on, on how to do that. Again, working with your community-based organizations and your ethnic media, um, they're gonna have the relationships with those communities. They're gonna be able to make sure that um, any materials that you are translating are culturally competent and they're going to be in a way that um, that community is going to be able to uh, interpret them and then engage with you as needed. So related to that, um, another good tip on this front is to have members of the community you're trying to reach, check your messaging. Um, so again, making sure that you're translating, a lot of this is very technical, um, so making sure that it's gonna resonate in that language that you're trying to engage people with. Um, potentially uh, using local agency employees um, that are bilingual um, to help translate materials or do interpretation at meetings as appropriate. Um, just some things to consider there. Um, so here are some outreach strategies to reach beyond the usuals. And so whether this means people who speak another language, whether this is um, your student or youth population or an older demographic, um, people who just don't normally engage with you outside of those quote, same 10 people we talked about earlier. Um, so we've hit on some of this already, but um, make sure that you're using culturally and demographically appropriate outreach materials. So again, working with your community-based organizations or members of that community to help you do that. Make sure that you're accounting for any translation or closed captioning or things like that that are needed. Um, and making sure you're budgeting for this and planning for it appropriately. This all takes time, it all takes budget. Um, so just making sure that you're accounting for all of that when you're planning your approach. Um, so we have a couple of slides here on messaging because again, this content is very technical and can be very jargon heavy. Um, so just some things to consider um, when, you're, when you're crafting your message. Um, and Wendy, I think you wanted to take a, a, this slide. Next one. Or we can do it here too. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right. Yeah. Well, and so one of the things that we wanted to do is, you know, I've had conversations where I've worked with city managers and we've gone through projects and they go, look, Wendy, we don't want any of the planneries. Just share with the community what, you know, the so what factor, what it means to them, why they should care. And we trust that you will be able to get all the planning details in between to make that happen. So to simplify it and pull it back, I kind of use it, I call it my grandma test. Like what would I use, what messaging would I use to be able to explain this to my grandma and, and move it forward? Now, don't get me wrong, there are community members and um, advocates that are very into the details. And those people you definitely spend the time with because that's the, the opportunity to show the transparency I know that, you know, what I've been hearing is that, you know, there are some groups out there that are, you know, wanting to understand the methodology between or about that, you know, the housing inventory and what's counted and what's not. And the whole point is to be transparent about it. They can disagree on the approach, but always making sure that there's a platform to have that information available is important. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so here are just some additional considerations. Um, as you think through your messaging. Again, knowing your audience and making sure you're speaking um, either the actual language or their language in terms of how they're gonna consume information. Um, try to minimize the content on your slides. So 
so it isn't just a bullet list. Use visuals, um, use other other components, pictures, and things like that as you as you can um, to make sure you're conveying your message in a way that's going to translate to your community members. Um, try to limit jargon and acronyms. Um, so one thing we found particularly in this um, virtual environment is that if your community doesn't understand something um, or if they're confused about something, they may not ask that question. They may just leave your meeting with kind of a sour taste in their mouth and um, not a positive uh, interpretation of your, of your plan, of your project, of the meeting itself or of the agency. Um, so to really try to make sure that your messaging and your uh, presentations and, all, and your interactions are resonating with your community. Um, and then this is just kind of a high level. Um, I'm sure these have all been terms you've used at uh, presentations or in reports or in um, documents to your community. Uh, and just a reminder that these are frequently misunderstood by your community. Um, so back to Wendy's point about uh, making sure that your messaging resonates. Um, try to avoid the jargon if you can. I know some of these are gonna be unavoidable when talking about housing and housing elements, but um, just keep in the back of your mind to make sure you're explaining these terms um, and using the most common language possible. And then finally, before I turn it over to the local examples, um, some considerations as you as you map out your, your approach to community engagement. Again, who is in your community? Who are you trying to reach? Will the, the tools and the um, techniques that you're using reach that population? Um, what's the purpose of your engagement? What input are you trying to seek? Um, and are the tools going to get you that input that you need? If you're really just trying to share information, um, that's a different type of platform than if you're trying to create that two-way dialogue. Um, where are you in the process? Do you have time to incorporate their feedback? Because again, to Wendy's point, don't ask people for feedback that you're not going to use. That's a really easy way to break trust with your community. Um, and just making sure you have a mix of high-tech and low-tech or in-person and digital um, techniques so that you're, you're reaching the, all of the segments of your community. Um, and Wendy, if you don't have any closing thoughts, I'm going to turn it over to Chula Vista to talk about their um, approach. Great. Perfect. Hi. So good afternoon. Um, Chula Vista is a city down in San Diego County, just south of, of the city of San Diego. Uh, just to reiterate what everyone has been talking about, it's about knowing who your community is. Uh, Chula Vista is a very diverse community in terms of our income and our race. Our population is about 44% low income. Most of them, about 44%, live west of the I-805 in our older established neighborhoods. 61% of our population is Hispanic, many of whom have very limited English skills. And again, you need to know who your audience is in order to target them, to market to them, to speak with them, and to engage with them. And then knowing who they are and their demographics played a really big part for us in the results of our public participation process. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we as a city were already working on what is our public outreach and engagement model. Um, and we had developed a model that really uh, is based upon meeting the community where they are from that technical standpoint of language um, and simplicity, but also from an emotional and a social perspective as well. So before COVID-19, our community was really one that already shied away from digital tools. They preferred the trust and the relationships that were built from face-to-face -face conversations. Um, several of our nonprofits and the city as well have used an active promotora model of engagement, whether it was from the census, housing element, healthy living, anything that we were pushing out, we really engaged with our social service providers in a promotora model. Um, and so, but with the COVID-19 model now in environment, it really pushed us in the direction um, of digital access, but our community really had difficulty navigating this process. And so unfortunately for us, we did do some face-to-face -face meetings in the beginning, but the bulk of our participation came during COVID-19. Uh, we conducted an online survey, just like many of you will do. We held virtual meetings with our community stakeholders. We did many presentations to several of our commissions through their board meetings. Um, and I'm gonna echo all of the comments that are made from the presenters before. 
really using the easiest virtual tools possible, keeping it simple and intuitive. Um, our jurisdiction, uh, we are not allowed to use Zoom. Uh, so we use the WebEx platform. I don't, I don't prefer that platform. I think the community is used to using Zoom um, or Microsoft Teams, uh, and they have a preference. So if you have a community that already has difficulty with uh, virtual tools, using those tools that they're already starting to get used to is probably a better way to go. And then with our community as well, planning for that lowest common denominator, had lots of people with bad Wi-Fi connections getting booted out, not technically savvy. So really trying to provide as much instructions as possible before your virtual meetings and to guide them through the expectations. If you can do those early tests of the technology before meeting starts, that's always great. Um, and then also what we have always employed is really leveraging opportunities and joining forces. While we've been doing the housing element update, we've also been doing outreach on the census. So a lot of our tools, a lot of our outreach, we combined a lot of the census efforts um, with the housing element efforts. Uh, we're in the back to school mode. So we're in the food distribution mode. So a lot of our outreach in terms of our surveys or our community meetings, we would target those events as well. And then lastly, your commission members. We did an enormous amount of meetings with our commission members. We really look at our commission members as being ambassadors. Um, they have a circle of influence, they have friends, they have colleagues, and we look to them to kind of push that message out to the greater community. Uh, also then uh, what we found and discovered when we were working on our outreach model was that Really, our community gets their information through just their daily lives, how they're interacting day to day. So social media, news, uh, newspapers, radio, those were really our biggest outlets where we would do our outreach in terms of marketing for meetings and the surveys. Uh, we did do a direct mailing and emails. We find that our community really is inundated. And when I said we partnered with our census efforts, we did actually a direct mail distribution to over 30,000 multifamily complexes west of the I-805 where our lower income people reside. We did direct mailers to all of those multifamily projects. And we did direct mailers to our mobile home community who also tend to be lower income. Uh, that didn't work out so well for us. Out of all of those, we maybe got maybe a handful uh, in terms of the tick in our surveys. So that didn't work out too well for us, but it is an old school way of doing things um, and a low, you know, it's just the, a lower a lower sense there. Oh, so what we would also encourage you to do is while we used our social media and you can see a few examples of what we did, we used our own city accounts uh, we really would advocate for people to use and pay for uh, sponsored, sponsored ads on social media. When you're using your own city account, you really are reaching those people who really are already engaged in the process or are looking at city news anyways. But if you're doing the sponsored targeted ads in a geographic area, that'll get you more people that you didn't normally see. So even though you may think that you've done everything right in terms of the marketing, the tools, and we try to do everything right, uh, it still boils down to this. Is this a topic that your community is interested at this moment in time? Can you be, will they be engaged and will they be present in the process? So for Chula Vista, that meeting our constituents where they are, it really took an emotional and a social perspective um, as we bring COVID-19. So for our community where we have 44% are lower income, we also have one of the highest infection rates for COVID-19 in two of our census, in two of our zip codes in all of San Diego County. So for our community, what was on their minds and where they were at was two hours waiting in line for food. How are they gonna pay for their rent? How are they providing for daycare if they're going out and working? Uh, they've got kids at home who are distanced distant learning. 
Uh, so for them, these long-term plans of housing and bigger policy issues wasn't something that they were thinking about. They're thinking about more of the tangibles of daycare, rent, et cetera. Um, and that really came across for us in an example, our survey, our housing survey, in the first week of having that survey out, we got maybe 200 survey responses. A few weeks later, we sent out using same, same techniques, um, a survey related to our economy and jobs, that we got a response of over 800 people in that survey. So what we've done to fill this gap when your general community is not participating in a way in which you want them to, is we kind of said, okay, we're okay with this. We understand where they're coming from. And so again, the, the tip about going to those social service providers, having that relationship with our resource centers in the schools, the educators, social service providers, and all of these advocates that are out there that are the voice of the individuals you're trying to reach and continue to work with them in developing policies and programs that really start to address the housing needs. Because they'll be your voice when your community is thinking about and taking care of business at home. So that concludes Chula Vista's uh, tips and things that we've encountered during our process thus far. No, perfect, right. thank you so much for uh, sharing your, your perspective and how you're working with community-based organizations and meeting your community where they are. Uh, so up next, we've got Placer County. Hi, everyone. I'm Shauna Pervines. I'm with Placer County. For those that um, maybe don't know where Placer County is, we are um, on the west. Uh, we butt up against Sacramento County, and we stretch all the way to the Nevada County line. Um, taking in the north part of uh, Lake Tahoe. Um, we have a really diverse community as well. We have 13 different um, communities just in the unincorporated area of Placer County, and um, each one has kind of their own unique needs. And so we've learned um, just a lot about different opportunities and um, methods and services that you can use for community outreach. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about some successes we've had here at Foster County, um, primarily using um, Flash Vote. We, we actually do mix and mingle some of our outreach efforts, um, just as everybody else does, but uh, the, the Flash Vote has really um, assisted, you know, with uh, our really getting to know what people need. So um, to start, um, we actually started using Flash Vote around housing about three years ago. Um, we internally always knew that it was information we were gathering for a future housing element um, update, um, which I realize is probably not the best tip to give you at the moment, seeing as you're all probably knee deep in trying to get the current housing element done right now. Um, but I think there's still plenty of time. Uh, we did um, four, to a total of five actually, uh, surveys over the last three years, each kind of building on um, a theme uh, where we never actually talked about policy. We never said, hey, we're looking to update a housing element. We didn't do any of that. We just asked some very simple questions. Um, if you're not familiar with Flash Vote, um, you, they, uh, generally it's a, it's a very um, simplified survey that is uh, um, both kind of multi-channel. You can get on it and do it either web, text, phone. It's also multilingual. Um, and it asks uh, about four to five questions in a 48 hour period. So it's a very quick snapshot. Um, we currently have about 6,000 people signed up for any one of our flash votes. Um, and we have an amazing response in that 48 hour period. Um, we see upwards of more than, more than 50%, 53, 54%. And we actually set a record real recently with um, 40, almost 4,700 responses to our last flash vote uh, uh, survey. Um, but it's it's an opportunity not only for the people that are just jumping on and taking these to see their results because they get the results just as we do, but then we're able to share those results as part of meetings. So instead of taking the surveys in the meetings with just those that come to the meeting, we actually are taking the survey before the meeting. Um, so some examples of the surveys that we've actually um, done, uh, we did a second home. Uh, again, I mentioned we are in the Tahoe area. Um, that's a unique situation. We actually, in, uh, in that area, have more houses than people. 
Um, we have about 15,000 um, residential units up in that area, but only about 12,000 in population. Uh, but as most of you probably understand, we uh, most of those homes, upwards of almost 80% of those homes, um, are either second or third homes and sit vacant most of the year, or they're utilized as short-term rentals. Um, so a very unique challenge up there. Um, so we asked some questions about what it would take to um, incentivize those that have second or third homes to uh, uh, use those for long-term leases to help meet some of our employment needs up there. Um, we also went out with a very quick survey about housing costs and needs. Um, and then we followed that one up with housing choices of what types of housing people would like to see. Um, and then we did one just in and around accessory dwelling units. Um, and then last, after we had all of those, um, we actually thought we probably had some uh, enough information and we were able to kind of um, collect that information and kind of start sharing it with our stakeholders and, and those that are um, on our lists, um, our notification lists. Um, but with COVID, we thought we probably need to do this one more time. And so right before we had our countywide meeting, we did one more um, uh, flash vote that we went out with just um, kind of to ask that COVID question, like how is this affecting you? Um, particularly in the housing, you know, is there something we should be paying attention to? And that was actually the very first survey we ever even mentioned the housing element update. We did mention that we are looking to update some of our policies and that um, and that this would help us with that. So um, it is, um, uh, it's, it's been a really great experience working um, with FlashVote. We also use other sources, Gov Delivery. Um, we like to Zoom just like everybody else. I think what we did learn, learn with our meetings in, this, in the COVID world when we were starting this earlier in spring was really paying attention to um, the time of the meeting. Um, historically, you know, you would never have a meeting, you know, in the middle of the day, it would always be in the evening to, to, to really grab everybody. Um, the uniqueness of Placer County was um, the sweet spot was between like 11 and two. That seemed to make people most happy and where we could get the most out. So really kind of trying to pay attention to where you might find the most um, engagement is going to be important. So um, with that, I will um, go ahead and turn it over to the next panelist and um, enjoy your day. Great, thanks Shauna. Um, so we're gonna move on to Elk Grove and Christopher, I'm gonna go ahead and turn um, this over to you so that you can show everyone your tool. Great, thanks, and good afternoon, everybody. So give me just a minute. I believe you guys are seeing it, right? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna go through this kind of briefly in the interest of time. Um, but for those of you that don't know, Elk Grove, we are in south in the Sacramento County, uh, second largest city in the Sacramento region, uh, at about 176,000 people. We're in the middle of our housing element update. We're due for a delivery. Uh, middle of May, so time is not on our side. Um, so we started planning our outreach early in the year. Obviously, all of that got thrown out the window by the time March rolled around. We actually had a couple of meetings scheduled at the end of March that we had to cancel about a week out. Uh, but going into all that, we knew we wanted to do something that was interactive, that engaged with folks, and got people into the experience of what the Planning Commission and the City Council will ultimately go through. Um, the idea being that there are a lot of hard decisions that have to get made through this process. And if we're not giving folks all the information, all the resources to understand the problem, how can we really expect them to give good feedback and to understand what's going on? Um, so I'm going to show up here. Uh, this is the city website. Um, the long URL is kind of hidden, but it's elkgrovecity.org slash housing elements. You can get to all the resources. We've been updating this on a regular basis with a bunch of information. Um, but about halfway down the page is the section called how you can help and what it gets to is an opportunity for folks to make their own housing plan again the idea being as a residence we want to empower folks to give us their thoughts about what sites could be included in the housing element uh, that could count towards uh, lower income uh, needs so i'm going to jump over here this is the actual tool that, that link takes you to um, it's a web platform called Balancing Act or A Balancing Act. Uh, it was originally designed for budget scenario planning. So the idea being that uh, you would ask a series of questions about how folks want their tax money spent and you can use that information to then make decisions in the budgeting process. We wanted something that 
did similar aspects. We wanted people to be able to interact with it in real time and get information about how their housing plan would actually work. Or is the selection of sites that you want going to get to a balanced plan or is it not? Because oftentimes, and definitely in the last couple of rounds we've done, we get people that are issue focused. They're specific to, I only care about this site, I'm gonna show up at a public meeting and I'm gonna talk about how horrible that site is and how you're all a bunch of uh, crazy government people for trying to put housing on that site, never mind the fact that it's around the corner from my house. If you look more broadly at the issue, you look at it as a citywide issue of concern, and that's something we've done with our messaging throughout is we're trying to solve the housing crisis, Elk Grove's trying to do its part, then we can look at this more globally and we can understand it more as a community. Um, so I'm gonna walk through the tool just a little bit um, to give you a sense, there's a, a splash screen here with a lot of information we've plugged in, probably maybe even a little too much, but it gives you a good sense about how the tool works and what we're asking folks to do. I'll click out of that. We ended up organizing the site based upon our council districts, um, just because there are so many sites to look at, we think that's a good way to look at it. We've had a couple of council members, some residents asked early on if we could look at the data that way, and look at uh, distribution of units around the city, and that may be one mechanism to do it. Certainly other ways you could. Um, so it starts out by telling you you're deficient. You don't have enough sites here in order to have a qualified plan. But I'm gonna start down here with the housing needs allocation. We plug in our arena allocation here, and then um, because of um, changes in state law and the need to sort of look at no net loss, um, we've included a buffer component, and folks can go in and change the buffer setting of how many more units above the allocation are they willing to take in order to give the city flexibility in the long term. So there's options there and you get to select those radio buttons to do that. And then for the sites themselves over here on the right hand side, I'll just go here into district one as an example. We've sort of got three categories of sites. The first are existing sites that are just gonna roll forward and they show up as static sites. Um, I don't remember if there's one here. There's definitely one here in district four. Give a better sample. Yeah, so existing site E1, uh, that's a lock site. We're not changing the density. We're not proposing any changes to it. So it's just in here. You get credit for the units. Um, then there's existing sites that maybe we're going to rezone, uh, increase the allowed density, the, increase the base density on those sites. So we can ask those questions. And in real time, you click on the button, it adds additional units, and the charts start changing. And then we have the new sites, the candidate sites, which uh, this will be easier up here in District 1 to look at. Um, for these candidate sites, then we ask, should these be included or not? Yes or no, and again, it makes those changes. And then for each site, we were able to go in and add a little bit more information about what's the size, character, we can plug all this text in exactly how we want it, and then in more details, you can actually add in an exhibit that shows you where that site is located. And then for each of the sites, people can leave comments. So again, it's a budgeting tool initially, but it does exactly what we wanted it to do by getting folks to having a qualified a, a housing plan that was balanced or at least met the minimum needs of RENA plus whatever uh, that uh, buffer allocation was. The site doesn't let you actually submit a plan, and we chose to do this, doesn't let you submit a plan unless it is balanced. We could have turned that function off. We felt it was important though for folks, rather than just going in and keep tagging one site that they didn't want to have included, uh, that they look at the sites in totality and consider that. And so far, the feedback has been positive about the fact that we've set that up that way. Um, there's a dashboard on the back end of it. Um, just go in here, so we pull it up real quick. Um, that shows uh, the route, total page views and generally where those views are coming from. It's all driven by Google Analytics, so it can get a little spotty sometimes just because it's Google. But you can see the total submissions we've had to date at 67. Um, which is way better than where we were a month ago. We've been doing a lot of uh, pushing out of messaging, uh, some planning commission and city council agenda items on it. So it's got more folks to it. Um, I won't go through all of this data, but know a lot of stuff is here, a lot of cool charts and information. You can dive into the details of this. It exports out to Excel. So we've built a little calculator here where we can dump the raw data in and we can see based upon the total submissions, what the percentages are for yes or no. Um, on these sites and then carry all that back over. And we can start uh, categorizing based on what we're seeing here and other anecdotal information from owners uh, and other com correspondence we get in, other analysis we'll do on the sites. If we start including them, what does that end up doing to the distribution of units and do we end up meeting the arena overall? So, so far, a lot of great positive feedback from folks on this. Everyone seems really happy with it. 
um, I think it's been a good opportunity. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to you all. Thank you. Perfect, thanks Christopher. I'll go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, and we are running short on time, but I think we probably have time for a couple of questions. Um, Jenny and Carly, you guys have been monitoring those. Um, I know Christopher had to, I think he had to jump off, but there was some questions um, that we can direct towards Christopher to get answered. And um, there was a question about sharing the, the actual questions and answers. So um, as Melissa said, we will share all of that um, information with the group after the meeting. There's been some really great questions um, about, um, there, there's one question about how do we get the majority of residents who can afford to live in high income areas with those that do not currently live, want to, or who do not currently live in the community, but want to, to move into the community and what are the ideas for engagement on that? Um, any suggestions on that? Can you clarify, Jenny? Like, was so so there are people that want to move into part of the community in a, in. Correct. It, it's just we're talking about people that they that might want to be moving into the community. How do we get that input engaged in the document? Ah, uh, so like future residents. Yes. Interesting. Well, I guess you know I would be curious, and, and so Hob, you can jump in. You know, from an engagement perspective, it's like if you already know there's a, a huge interest, you know, where's that coming from? What, how are you getting? If they don't already live in that community, where is that information? Because then you could do surveys, you could start gathering that data, and you know, just like you do any project, if you're looking at you know market demand, what's there, that helps to inform what you're planning for in the future. Because I know a lot of people are updating their general plans at the same time they're updating their housing elements. So if there is a way, you know, even just starting a list of, you know, starting to get that, um, you know, I'm interested in moving here, and that's a group of people that can be recessed, um, accessed as a um, resource, I think then it just builds over time, and then you can just keep engaging them and then pour that information into whatever programs you're using you now. Thanks. Um, there's a great question from Kate. Do you have suggestions for providing language access during online meetings or should these be separate meetings or separate breakout groups? Want you take that uh, one too? Or Melissa? Yeah, I'll jump in and feel free to add, Wendy. Um, I, we've seen it done both ways. Um, so again, some of the platforms allow for simultaneous um, translation or interpretation services so you can run the meeting concurrently. Um, but you would obviously need to be thinking about um, translating all of your materials, your slide deck, any polling that you're doing, um, and making sure that you have that interpreter on on DAC um, to make sure you can do this concurrently. Um, but you could also do them as separate meetings um, where you have a little bit more focused um, content and materials for for those populations if they have different um, needs or you're looking for different information from them. Um, so I think you can do it either way, um, whatever fits your your needs and um, your capacity the best. Wendy, anything to add to that? No, oh, I, I think you've got it. it. It just depends on the amount of attention that that group needs. Is it more one-on-one -on -one or is it, if you can have it, that there is comfort in doing it at the same time because if you're translating the, the presentation as it's happening, then everybody knows they're getting the same information all at once and that different information isn't being shared between the two meetings. Okay, last question, and then, like we said, we will um, share questions and answers, but um, there was a question that I thought what might be helpful for the group is, what public engagement tools are best suited for accommodating visuals? I don't know that there's um, a test. <laughs> Melissa, you want to take it? <laughs> well, I, I was more curious if there's any, um, any more clarification. Is that in terms of the actual like, platform for meetings or is that other yes, tools? Yes, but uh, if you're doing a virtual meeting and you want to make sure to incorporate visuals, maps and those things, what's the easiest tool for that? 
Um, so of the platforms I've used, they all allow for kind of this screen share component. And obviously you saw us toggle between um, a, a PowerPoint and other um, internet-based programs and things like that. And so uh, most of the platforms I've used allow for that functionality, if that's the type of visuals that you're looking for. Um, a lot of them, so also you'll notice on this platform, um, you can have handouts. And so we've added the slide deck in there for you all. Um, which I mentioned earlier, um, but there's also uh, that functionality that you can use to add handouts in um, in Zoom. Um, for example, I know that you there's a whiteboard function and you can take notes and share things that way um, and get input from other people. Um, I don't know if I have a recommendation on the best platform, but most of them allow for um, for visual sharing. Um, Wendy, anything to add to that or anybody yeah. else? It, it, it really all depends because there are, um, yeah, you can share all of everything, like you said, on Zoom and a lot of those platforms. There are other platforms like Jamboard, where if you're trying to do a post-it note exercise, you can actually have people type things and then they put stickies and they can move things around. You can also find creative ways to have people, if you like share your screen and do a PowerPoint, if you let everybody mark up. Like if you're trying to do a mini survey just with people that you're working with, they can mark up and vote on the PowerPoint and you just clear it because it's not a real vote. It's something just to kind of see where the group is for a dialogue. So sometimes it's actually getting creative and using the tools that are there and using them in a different way than we historically have used them. Okay, I think we'll leave it there on the question since it's after three. Um. Um, I we do also have just um, in the PowerPoint, if I can toggle back to that, here, here we go. Um, we have included links to all of the examples that we shared today. Um, if you want more information, so Placer County Splash Note surveys are on here, um, Elk Grove's Balancing Act platform. Um, so if you want more information on any of those, um, the links are in here for you as well. Um, and then we just have a few additional resources to share from IAP2 that we've talked about earlier, some ILG resources, um, and obviously HCD's um, web portal for SB2 and LEAP grants. Um, Wendy or Sohab, anything to add there? Sohab, there was a question of when your HCD information would be coming out on meetings. Sure, you mean the public engagement guide? Yeah. I'm assuming, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. We are working on that right now. We're actually doing some of our final drafts. Um, we're getting feedback from advocates, so we hope to have it, I want to say by the end of the month, but just in case, I'll say by early October. And also, please feel free to reach out to HCD in the meantime if you want any guidance, or maybe we can unofficially share that guide with you. Yeah, and I think the only other thing to mention is that on the IAP2 website, the IAP2 USA website, um, if you are a member, they have webinars constantly, and whether... It, it depends whatever topic you have if you're having if it's a technology question how to reach um, vulnerable populations how to deal with emotion and outrage there's all of these things you can focus in on that particular issue because most of the time when we do outreach meetings like this it's so broad and it's hard to hit on the details that you guys want to discuss great and so with that i know we went over a couple minutes so i appreciate everyone waiting and, and um, holding in there um, I really appreciate everyone for registering and signing up this webinar and attending. We hope that you took some valuable feedback um, back to your, you take your valuable feedback back to the housing element update. Also, please feel free to reach out to any of our panelists with questions. Um, and Melissa will probably, ILG will probably follow up with um, a list of other resources and the webinar link with the recording as well after this webinar. With yes. So we will um, we'll include the slide deck and the recording, um, the responses from the polling earlier, um, and then links to some additional resources for you all, um, including the local examples that we shared today. So keep an eye out for that in the next few days. Great, thank you. And with that, we shall close the webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye guys. Thank you. Thanks everyone.